right, hello and welcome to the Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Christine Paracas, who is up in lovely Marina del Rey, just up the coast from me here in San Diego. She's up in LA. How are you doing, Christine? Fantastic. So happy to be here, John. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. And uh, again, Christine, the C-level executor, investor, trainer, and boat captain. And as I discovered, not just boat captain, she's also been a ski instructor um, and many, many other things revolving around mastery. And you have a new book coming out uh, early next year, uh, all about the, called The Resilient Leader and Category 5 Leadership Programs, right? And uh, how, to, how to survive uncertainties and turmoil. And before we're coming on air, you were just telling me that this book is based on your experience of Category 5 hurricanes in the, in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So maybe just start off by telling us about the hurricanes and the genesis of this book. Well, I'd written my first book, The Entrepreneur's Essential Roadmap, which was very successful and really exciting and fun. I was out doing workshops and speaking and enjoying the successes of that. And I had, um, had a home in the Caribbean that I was uh, going back and forth to at the time and uh, was down there during uh, the hurricanes Irma and Maria that came over the British Virgin Islands, actually direct, oh, sorry. tore sorry. the roof off my house, left me buried alive for almost 24 hours. And that was the easy part because it was surviving in the aftermath of months without electricity, running water, telecoms. Imagine life without a smartphone, <laughs> without internet access. You can't even get a weather forecast. Yeah, anybody under the age of, I don't know, about 35 maybe is probably going, what? That's, how could you possibly survive without those things? And you think, well, actually, we did once upon a time. We didn't even need hurricanes. We just didn't have them. Uh, we didn't have those smartphones. But so and going back, so in the, in the initial moments, like when you're caught in something like that and you say you're buried alive, um, what, it's number one, what's that feeling like? And second off, how do you kind of gather yourself to then deal with the aftermath? Well, that's exactly the point, right? What do we do when we don't have smartphones or technology or fingers at our fingertips? And so, you know, there I was realizing that I'm trapped in my sheltered space and I'm, I have no way out. I have no one coming. I have no plan. I have no way to reach anybody. And I don't know who's survived and what condition the rest of the people I knew uh, were in at that point. So the panic's starting to rise. And, and anybody, whether you've been in a hurricane or some other Category 5 situation, which could be starting a business, mm -hmm. having a child, doing all kinds of things that aren't as terrifying as a storm, but become a Category 5 level situation, and the, the panic starts to rise, and you could become immobilized. And there are stories about refugees sitting on their porches just waiting for someone to come. And I didn't have a porch to get access to, but I did sitting in the dark with a flashlight and knowing that I got to get through hours before it's the storm passes and I've got mm -hmm. some, some way to think about something. My mind is going crazy. Get a pen and a paper, pencil and paper, something to start writing with. Because there's actually studies about how when we write with our hands, we're communicating from the brain to the hands, activating that problem-solving section of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. And so I just started writing. I wrote down lists of things I'd learned, mistakes I'd made, and I just got myself through that 24 hours that way. And it's funny. It's interesting you just mentioned that as an aside here. Um, because I was speaking to a class uh, at DePaul University the other day online. Um, they're, they're, they're doing um, their sales undergraduates. They do a sales program up there. And I told them that about the fact that there's been studies done is that when you write a to-do list down with a pen and paper, the probability of you actually executing on those to-dos are way higher than if you make a digital list. Can I tell you a funny side story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the yeah. way I learned this was I was a freshman in college and it had been my dream to skydive at that point. Mm -hmm. So I got this opportunity, went out to the field and I'd been told by some experts who said, no one remembers their first jump. Take a piece of paper and a pencil back then, you know, mm -hmm. a, a wheel and a you know a match, and 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 write down your thoughts when as soon as you land. 
And so mm. because I knew I was going to do that and I had a pencil and piece of paper in the back pocket of my jumpsuit, I'm in the air to this day, years and years later, I can remember what it was like to fly through the air like a bird because I was recording in my mind all the things I was going to write down about when I got to the ground. And I will never forget that first jump. Yeah, and that's such a great, and that's so powerful. And I think, unfortunately, not to get off on sidetracked here, but I think it's unfortunate today that people don't live the experiences because they're too busy recording them. So they're kind of a device removed from the reality of what's going on around them. And I think that's, that's a shame. So, okay, so you're, so the lessons you've learned here, so your, your house is flattened, you're without electricity or whatever. Um, so the first thing, obviously, is to get over that paralysis of just like, I don't know what to do, therefore I'm not going to do anything. And you start to put a plan in place. So what does what does the initial plan look like? And what's your advice to people when they're in a situation like that? What is the best first step or is it just taking a first step? Well, yes, yes and yes, right? It yeah. is doing something. And so once you assess, you know, at that point, what do I have left? What do, where can I do and what do I need? So I need to get help. I need uh, people because I was alone and I was the only person mm -hmm. I knew on the island who went home to weather that storm alone. And I don't know what possessed me at the time. You know, ignorance is bliss, they say, but, you know. <laughs> hey, well, you got a book out of it, Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's the thing is there's a loneliness epidemic in our country. Millennials, 25% of them have no one, no friends. 40% of our population is lonely, has no one to talk to. And there I was with, you know, hundreds, thousands of social media followers thinking I'm not one of those people because I have, you know, a community mm -hmm. of friends all over Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and, you know, whatnot. And I didn't realize that I didn't know my neighbors until I needed mm -hmm. them. So the right, first right. thing I had to do was start to build community. And how do you do that? Most of us are not going to pick up the phone and ask for help. And certainly didn't have a phone to pick up. <laughs> but it's stepping into service. So finding ways. What can I do to help my people around me and in turn get what I needed taken care of? So I had working wheels at that time. I had a moderately, mildly damaged car that I could do water runs, food runs, start going out and getting supplies and stuff for my community. And by turn, they, did, they took care of me. And I, think, uh, and I think, Christine, that that is such a powerful, powerful message, but it's also such a timely one because, uh, you know, we live in a world today where obviously there's a lot of angst and anger. And as, as somebody mentioned, which I love the term, like recreational anger, it's almost like people, <laughs> it's, their, it's, it's their hobby now is to get angry about stuff, right? And, but, I mean, a lot of the things that people rant and rave about and get upset about are things that are largely outside of their control, right? That they can't change. But if, if, we, if people just focused on themselves and their community and just doing, doing good things, and as you say, if you're in business, you know, getting a service mentality going, the, the impact of that, of if everybody was doing that, think of what the world would be like. Yeah, we have to set aside our differences because we never know we're gonna, when we're going to be in a Category 5 situation. Forget the hurricanes, because most of our <laughs> listeners are not sure. going to be in a, yeah. in a hurricane situation, but they'll be in something, whether it's starting a business or having a child or doing something, having a, a terminal illness, a terminally ill parent. You know, I'm taking care of elderly parents, another mm -hmm. Category 5 situation no one for prepares sure. you for. So we have to figure out ways to uh, bridge the divides between us and find the commonalities because we have them no matter what. Yeah, and exactly. And I mean, when it comes that time when you need somebody, I mean, you should kind of consider where you are today, because when that time comes, you're not going to be saying, oh, well, who did you vote for? Or who did you whatever? You're Because you, <laughs> you won't have time for all that. So to be honest, you shouldn't really be focusing so much on that right now. Either. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, tragedy and, you know, uh, d catastrophes tend to bring mm. us together, but it's usually fleeting. And as soon mm. as the, the danger is over, we go our separate ways again. And it's re our responsibility as human beings and to break through this epidemic, to just forget that and stay with the communities, practice, volunteer, be in touch with people, learn your neighbor's names, you know, be mm -hmm. the person who will come for offer to be the person who will come for those people in a storm. And then they in turn will do the same for you. 
Yeah, and 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 unfortunately today, a lot of when people do those kind of things, they kind of stand out, and then you think, wow, that's kind of sad that they stand out for doing, you know, what the right thing. So you talk about seven barometers of resilience. I'm really fascinated by that. So let's let's dig into some of those. What are what are some of the barometers of resilience? So these are what I call leadership strategies and they're applicable to anyone. And they, they're mm-hmm. the most important things to me, helped me survive and thrive in the aftermath of a disaster, but also to weather all kinds of business challenges in my life as a business leader. And the first and foremost one is you know, what I call having one hand on the boat, harnessing the power of the category five situation. And in sailing, I'm a boat captain, remember? Mm-hmm. So yeah. We make sure the rule of sailing is keeping one hand on the boat at all times. So that means both situational awareness, being aware of what's going on around you, but also self-awareness. Because Mm. we forget as human beings, we are autonomic in our responses, right? So something happens and we tell ourselves a story about it and we don't realize that we're listening to the story and not the actual events, So self-awareness reminds us or teaches us how to stay really focused on what's actually happening rather than the story of trauma. You know, I hear winds blow and I'm thinking trauma in my mind, but in fact, it's Mm -hmm. just a mild breeze, you know, (laughs) that's a metaphor for everyone, right? So Mm -hmm. it's self-awareness is the cornerstone to me of great leadership. And it's one that's ignored quite often. So keeping one hand on the boat is a barometer that is really important for leaders. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, I think of it, I think myself, self-awareness is one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself. One of the hardest ones to get to, uh, because it doesn't come naturally to a, to a, to, it doesn't come naturally to most of us, to be honest. Um, but when you see, and, I, and I've seen this myself, but when you see lack of self-awareness causes so much issues and it really holds people back from, from, from achieving their potential. And, and sometimes they don't realize when they're sort of going, why, why isn't this happening for me? And you just like, you just need to look in the mirror for a few minutes and then you'll figure it out and then life will be great. It might be painful for those few minutes, but it'll be great afterwards. Well, and how do you enroll, you know, whether it's investors, clients, uh, teams, Mm -hmm. you know, people that you need to be successful, you have to be a leader. All of us are leaders, regardless of what our official titles are, Mm -hmm. what our roles in life are. We are leaders. So we want to, you know, influence people to our points of view, to do what we want them to do or follow our vision and be at their most productive and highest and best. And we do that by doing that ourselves. And that requires really understanding where are those areas where we tend to slip or where am I, you know, not really doing a good job. And I've made those mistakes personally. You know, mm-hmm. I, my last startup, we went from zero to 100, um, 160 employees <laughs> within, you know, a few months. And uh, it was a very rapidly growing business, which was a great problem to have. But I was not prepared to be a leader of such a large team at that time. Right. If I knew then what I know now, you know, <laughs> so I had to learn the hard way, you know, whether it's alienating people or not being able to communicate, get my points across and help them understand the burdens I had to bear mm-hmm. made it harder on everybody. Yeah. And I just think, I, I, like I said, I think the greatest gift you can give yourself is just a little bit of introspection and try. And as you say, maybe uh, enlist some other people uh, who can give you some, you know, candid feedback, but I think self-awareness is is massive. And if it's the one thing, hey, some of us, it may have taken a little bit longer in our lives to reach <laughs> some this level of self-awareness. So any of you who are younger out there, save yourself a lot of trouble and uh, go on a journey of self-awareness as soon as you can. <laughs> well, and I talk about the category five leadership style. And I've used mm-hmm. expedition rules and outdoor, um, outward bound types of um, leadership strategies for that um, discussion, because we can all be leaders in every environment, whether that's designated, somebody who's at the top of the food mm-hmm. chain, or a peer leader, a self leader, or an active follower. And those are the mm-hmm. four types of leadership that I talk about in the book that are among the barometers of resilience. And we all have a place in them. So when I'm down on my island and I don't have a role and the government is destroyed, so there's no infrastructure, mm-hmm. nobody's really in charge, 
all we can do is step forward. So first taking yeah. a better care of myself so that in the second hurricane, two weeks later, I'm not a burden to my community by getting buried alive, but <laughs> I'm pitching in, I'm helping out. And then other people can rise up. Or sometimes you're just an active follower. You know, if you're a, a boat captain, you're a helms person, and you see something going on on the boat, and you're willing to step forward to help out. So you're part of the team. So you're not using that distance of here's my job and this is my role. So I'm not going to participate right. at other levels. You know, we're all part of yeah. this, trying to move in the same direction. Exactly, exactly. And I think, uh, and I really do think that hierarchical mindset is is very outdated because of the world we live in today. There's so many, uh, there's so many different skill sets and, and niche kind of very sp specific skill sets that you can't, you know, leaders can no longer really know everything, not that they ever could, but e even more now do they have to rely on people from all levels of the organization to be able to move forward. Well, and if you're trying to inspire people, you know, young people are so smart these days and they're not going to be, uh, let's say, snowed into following mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't walk the talk. You know, mm -hmm. I think that they're far more independent thinking than, than maybe my generation was. And so, you know, I remember the best leader I ever had years ago when I was teaching sailing, actually, in Mexico, that um, our, our chief, he was, you know, moving tables and chairs, doing things with mm -hmm. us side by side. You know, that's to me how you get people to do their best and step forward with you. Yeah, and, and one other subject just before we, we close this. So sometimes, I mean, there are people they can get, they can become great in a crisis, right? They're fantastic, all this, get all the energy going, get everything. But then when the, say, when the hurricane is abated and the house is rebuilt, they just fall back into old habits, right? So how do you mitigate against that? You have to make a commitment, right, to competency. I think it's the most important thing is learning how do you develop good judgment, right? It's, mm -hmm. Rita Mae Brown says, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. Because <laughs> these things are never going to stop. There's always going to be yeah. another storm. So if you win, you're in the calm, it's your job to get, grow your skills, become confident, don't get complacent. You know, it's the number one rule of seamanship is complacency kills. You don't mm -hmm. want to be among the dead. <laughs> and I think that's a great. And I mean, in in terms of business, it's the same thing as you don't want to put your feet up because everything seems to be going great right now. And then suddenly, like your largest customer calls up and says, "We just got acquired. Sorry," and they're going with a different vendor. And suddenly, you're in crisis again. You want to be constantly planning. Happens uh, all the time. As soon as you accomplish a milestone, people want to relax, take a deep breath. You know, you just rate, closed your, your A series of funding or, mm -hmm. you know, you just hired that CFO and then suddenly you're left without the keys to the kingdom and yeah. you have to be prepared for these things. Absolutely. Well, so Christine, this has been uh, fantastic, very insightful. So before we go, do you want to tell people a little bit more about how they can, about yourself and how they can find out more about you? Well, I'm a business growth architect and a best-selling author. I'm looking forward to launching my Resilient Leader book next year with Sourcebooks. And I'm at christineparakisglobal.com. And I also have an e-learning system that's an online business advisory that's at businessbreakthroughpro.com. Excellent. And all of these uh, links on your contributor profile will be up on, on Sales Pop. And your yes. current book and when your new book is out, we'll have a link to that as well. Fantastic. So I encourage you encourage everybody to look at that. Listen, Christine, this has been great. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Take care, everybody.